Well, good morning to those who are joining online. It's good to have you with us in the room here. You might not be able to see it, but we've got people that are finally able to come join us in person again. They've signed up in advance, and uh, believe it or not, not very many of them are wearing pajamas this morning. They've gotten like church clothes on and things they might normally wear out in public and have come to join us, and we're excited about that. We're looking forward to a day when you'll be able to join us in person again soon, though we recognize there's uh, either timing issues, health issues, use lots of reasons that people may still refrain from that. We'll talk a little more about what that expansion of that looks like uh, during the service uh, this morning as the governor has released uh, some more freedom in the state's understanding of those guidelines. I don't know what it's been looking like for you with some of that freedom. I had Thursday was the first time that I was eating lunch at a restaurant again. I had a person, we made a reservation, we went to Buffalo Wild Wings and the food was hotter than when I've gotten Buffalo Wild Wild Wings and taken it home to my house. They refilled my drink a couple of times, something I have desperately missed for some reason, even though I only had water to drink. It was just nice to have it refilled a couple of times and hope that you're finding things to enjoy as things are opening back up as well. I know that my daughter had this week, uh, it's summer break for her now, and so she was excited. I don't think she's worn shoes in the last three days since then as she's been out running around, spending time at the lake, spending time Uh, with uh, kids in the neighborhood a little bit. In fact, we've had different houses in our neighborhood host outdoor movie nights for the kids in our uh, cul-de-sac the last uh, this over the course of this weekend so I think Mariah saw midnight a couple of times she was super excited that she stayed up till morning but she actually then also slept in I left yesterday morning to go do something and Mariah was still in bed at 9 15 when I left in the morning and that's unheard of in our house and so we're excited about what the summer schedule has been able to mean in just the couple of days that we've had it and hope that you're finding things to be able to enjoy with the weather and with summer hitting as well. Don't know what it is that you're looking forward to, but excited for you to be able to experience more of those things as they open up. Uh, As we get ready for the service this morning, just want to remind you, if you didn't know in advance, we'll be celebrating communion during our service this morning. And so if you don't have elements ready, you can feel free to get those ready. If you're in the room and didn't grab elements on the way in, there's elements on the table. We'd encourage you to go grab those if you want to participate in in communion. We're, uh, cel- we'll celebrate God that way as a part of our worship this morning. And so I want to make sure you're prepared and ready for that as we get ready for it as well. You'll also hear if you're at home uh, during the announcements that uh, while we don't have anything going on in the building right now except our worship experiences on a Sunday, uh, that there is still opportunity for like an adult Sunday school. Pastor Bruce has filmed uh, Sunday school through uh, end time stuff, revelation mostly, but other prophecies about end times as well. And that's getting uploaded on our website under the resources tab. Again, you'll hear a little more about that during the service, uh, but want to let you know about some of that as well. Well, we're excited. We're going to be worshiping together through a variety of ways, music, communion, studying God's word this morning. And that'll start here uh, together in just a moment as the band leads us. And so we're getting ready for that. It'll start just about a minute from now. Well, it's good to see you here today, and good to see you online as well, and uh, just want to encourage you, there's this word, a line of this song that says, awake my soul and sing, and as you sing, as you prepare to come to worship, tell your soul, 
to awaken and ask God to awaken your soul. Because we are very aware of the stuff that's around us, the physical things that are around us. Uh, but sometimes we, we're, we're so aware of that stuff that we lose connection and lose track of where God is at. So ask God as you sing to awaken your soul to him. All right? Let's stand in here.
If you're in the room, you can go ahead and be seated. And it's wonderful to have you. We've, many of us, worshipped together over the course of the last 12 weeks, but I haven't been able to hear your voice. I haven't been able to see your face. I've had to deal with just the people up here, and you all sound better. (laughs) Collectively, it sounds better. It's been a joy worshipping with you all at home as well as we do that from afar, as we do that together. It's wonderful to lift the name of God together here. And now that Alliance Church, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ. Believe we do that best as we connect with each other. As we grow in our own relationship with God, encourage others to do the same, and as we participate in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. And there's a few different ways we can do some of those things still while things are distance. As I mentioned, if you were here at the hosting moment, we have a summer, a Sunday school online as you want to continue to grow in your own relationship with God. It's focused on the end time studies. Pastor Bruce has recorded that. He'll put that up every week for you. It's got a video. It's got a study guide that goes along with it. We'd love to have you participate that. You can find it on our website under the resources tab. So if you just navigate to our website on the resources tab, you'll find a Sunday school link there that'll have Pastor Bruce's class throughout the summer, and we'd love to have you join us in that. We'd also love to connect with you, whether that's still digitally or whether that's returning into our space as we worship together. We've got options for that. Today we had two options. This service here at 930 that's a contemporary style service at 11 o'clock. We'll have a traditional service upstairs that many signed up for as well. And As many of you may have followed along with the governor's announcement, starting next week, the capacity expands even a little more. Starting midway through the week, we can go from 25% capacity uh, to 50% capacity. We don't know that we'll get quite to 50% capacity while still doing social distancing, but we would have far more uh, chairs and people in the room this week uh, or next week than we were this week. Uh, For at least one more week, we'll still have a form online. It'll go online tomorrow where we'd love to know that you're coming. It'll help us space things and set things up well to be prepared for those who will be here with us in person. But each week things might slowly adjust and change a little more back to what we're used to as we see and experience what we learn week to week doing that together. And so if you're interested in joining us uh, here live next week, there'll be a form that'll go up tomorrow through Wednesday um, that you can just fill out. It's a simple name and how many of you will be here. And we'd love to know that so that we can uh, be prepared to worship with you in person next week. And one of the ways we always continue to worship God is by giving back to him some of what he's blessed us with. No pressure or obligation to do that, but our hope is to do that well as God provides for us. A few different ways that can happen. For those of you watching online, if you want to give by a check, you can always mail that in or come drop it off. If you're here and you brought an offering live, we've got an offering drop zone as you'll leave this morning. There's a a container you'll see on the table over this way that you can leave an offering in, although many of you may still be contributing digitally digitally through our website at nowthenalliance.org slash give or via text if you prefer to give that way. You can text the number that's on the screen either below me if you're watching through there or above me if you're watching in here. It's weird to figure all those things out in my own head. I'll be honest, it was one thing to just start speaking to a camera with nobody in a room and it's been one thing to speak to a room without having to worry about a camera And last week and this week, it makes my brain hurt trying to figure out how to do both. So thanks for having grace with me as we do that together. We're excited about how you've been giving, how you've been generous, both to our church and to our Benevolence Fund. It's helped us to be able to continue doing ministry the ways uh, we've been able to do it without having to think through a lot of the implications or complications for that. It's been able to help us bless our own community and bless uh, some of our partners around the, uh, the world as well. And so we're excited about that and thankful for you all continuing to give generously uh, to the God's work in that way. And we're going to continue in worship. And uh, before we do, I just want to pray, reminding us of our hearts for that, reminding us of God's generosity to us and, and our ability to then bring that back and give that back to him as an act of praise. Would you join me in that prayer? And God, we're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for what you've done in our lives. We're thankful for ways you've blessed us. We're thankful for how you've created us. We're thankful for the glory and honor that you have and that is due your name. And we pray as we take time to sing and to give and to reflect back to you who, about who you are, that it would be uh, pleasing and acceptable for you and that it would be transformative for us, that it would root us more deeply in our love for you and in your love for us. And that then when we leave, we would go out better displaying that to others as well. 
We know that happens solely because you're at work in our life. And so we ask for more of that work and pray for it. In Jesus' name, amen. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Stand with us. When I am alone, oh, when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me.
Lots of different times in the last 10 days or so, I've watched TV or the news or videos shared online and been broken hearted by things I've seen. Appropriately, most of the time, injustices they've been called. And they've saddened me having to watch them and see the full display of sin and evil that still clearly exists in our world. And yet, as hard as they've been to watch, they pale in comparison to the greatest injustice. When God's Son in the flesh was put to death by His own creation. Now, it wasn't video, but maybe many of you have seen artistic representation of that. What it looked like when His body was beaten. What it looked like when He was pierced with the spear. What it looked like when He breathed His last in front of a crowd something he did not crying out for help but willingly for you and for me and something he instructed his disciples to make sure that all the people of God would reflect on and remember through elements the elements of communion bread representing that broken body and a cup representing that shed blood Something that he instituted and says, celebrate this together as a people, remembering what I've done until I return to you. And so we'll do that. If you're here with us and you haven't grabbed elements, there'll be a song that'll play here in a moment. And during that song, you can feel free to head to the table and grab that. If you're at home, you still have a few minutes during this next worship talk song to grab elements. And then in a moment, I will lead us through taking them together reflecting on the greatest injustice in all of the world that happened so that we could be redeemed and restored. And God, we pray that while we reflect on that, on your love for us, expressed most clearly in Jesus' willingness to sacrifice himself for us, that we would do so recognizing it's not just something that brings us grief or sadness or despair, quite the opposite. It's something that brings us identity and purpose and hope. And that we would reflect on that in these moments, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
great body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is my blood, poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. God, we don't deserve what Jesus did for us, and he didn't deserve what we did to him. And yet it's the foundation of our relationship with you. It gives us hope, a living, never-ending, unceasing hope. And we pray more than just that thought of what's expected and what's to come, that it would root us with an understanding of your love for us, that it would be foundational to who we are, that it would be the basis by which we make all of our decisions and choose all of our behaviors. And that in this moment, as we reflect on that, you would use it to transform us more into the people you long for us to be. Pray that together. In Jesus' name, amen. You can feel free to rise and join me in continuing to worship God for what he's done for us.
Well, we'll continue in our worship this morning by studying God's Word. Returning back to our Roman series that we took a break from last week. If you have a Bible with you and will want to follow along, we'll be in Romans chapters 13 and 14 this morning. Just a recap of what Paul's letter to the Romans has looked like so far. It's a letter Paul is writing uh, because he has intention to make his way to Rome. And as he gets to Rome, his hope is then uh, that he would unify everybody in Rome, the Gentile believers and Jewish believers together on what the gospel looks like and ultimately then that they would send him out to Spain, be a new base for him as he leaves to go do missions work in Spain and take the gospel there. And so he's begun his letter addressing some of those things. He begins in chapter one with his thesis statement that he is not ashamed of the gospel for it's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the salvation for all men. It provides and shows us God's glory. And the hope is then that we would recognize our righteousness comes through faith. He's gone through showing us how all of creation is without excuse, that with God as our creator, uh, that we all should understand through creation that he exists and that our behaviors that we've been left to, the will that we've been given, God has given us over to the desires of our hearts and our minds, and we have fallen short, that we miss the mark, and that we're unrighteous by nature. And yet, through faith, we can find righteousness. Paul traces that through not just the Jewish believers, but even to Abraham and the promise to Abraham of righteousness by faith that came before law even existed. And says, essentially, give up on a law-based religion. Sin doesn't reign in your life anymore. Instead, grace reigns in your life that the things that were intended, like the law to bring life, ended up bringing death. That that was seized by the opportunity, as the Paul, Paul uses the phrases, and that the law put us to death. But the hope is that we would recognize that through that, God has a new covenant and that God has always been working for our good, that he does so through Jesus and that there's nothing that can separate us from that love. And God moves us then to a picture of this new covenant and new creation. That God remains faithful while Israel had unbelief. That when we've sought to establish our own righteousness, we've missed it. And that's a trap that still exists today to try to earn our righteousness and that we need to avoid it. He goes on to say then, and it doesn't just end with us. Once we have righteousness through faith, we're supposed to proclaim it to others. That's in chapter 10. He continues to talk about that, that, that his heart is that the Gentiles will understand that Paul still hopes to see the Jews saved as well. And because of that, the responsibility of all of us. The second major key point Paul makes in Romans chapter 12 is that we would offer our bodies as living sacrifices. That that's what would be holy and pleasing to God. That that would be our true act of worship. That that's how we would test and see and know and approve what God's will is. That through that, through being a living sacrifice, we'd find ways to live at peace with everyone. And then as he's closing chapter 12, that we would recognize we can overcome evil with good. And as Paul's talked about that, he's talked about what it's looked like for us individually. He's talked a little bit about what it looks like for the people of God collectively. He's going to start addressing some areas that will feel very topically different from what he's talked about so far to us but makes sense to the Jews and the Gentiles completely. You have to remember that as this has happened, there's this tension going on between the Jewish believers and Gentile believers of, of who's doing faith right. Are we responding to the laws of the old covenant? Do we still have to uh, designate what food is clean and what is unclean? What does it look like for us to observe the Sabbath? That there's these things that the Jews have held dear to themselves from the old covenant that the Gentiles haven't felt burdened by in the same way. And so they're wondering what that looks like. And one of the implications of that, particularly for the Jewish believers, is this understanding of who they're supposed to listen to. When the old covenant people of God were a nation by themselves, they listened through their national identity with God really well. And so the question for many of those believers, Jewish and Gentile alike, becomes, well, what do we do about the nation we live in now? Because the Romans are in charge. It's not a king in the line of David that's on the throne. It's Emperor Nero. 
What do we do then? When it's not a national identity anymore, what do we do with the authorities that are established above us? Paul begins to address that head on in chapter 13 as he begins verse 1 saying, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Before we move on, I just want to remind us, I've said it all right already, but Paul is writing this while a dictator emperor is in charge. He's not simply writing this to a society that's based on Christian faith and values. He's not writing this simply to a society that has a constitution that it loves and agrees with. He's writing this to a society that has a ruler most of them disagree with, who's power hungry and kills his own people. And Paul says to the people of God, be subject to the governing authorities. There's no authority except that which God has established. We don't get to pick and choose which rulers we follow and which ones we don't. Which govern authorities are the ones that are important. Which mandates they give and we say, well, I agree that that's for my benefit, so I'll submit to that one. But this other thing they're asking me, I don't like. It's not my preference, so I won't submit to it. Paul says, no, we're supposed to submit In fact, he goes on to say what happens when we don't. Verse 2, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Our particular country has a history of rebellion being a positive and celebrated thing. It's how we started. And that can be hard to remember when you read a verse like this. Whoever rebels is rebelling against the authority that God has instituted. So, but what if the rulers are bad? What if I'm afraid of what they may do? For rulers, he continues, hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you'll be commended. Because, verse 4, the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Emperor Nero, Paul says, was God's servant for their good. Pontius Pilate. Paul says, was God's servant for their good. President Trump, by implication, Paul says, was God's servant for our good. Governor Walls, by implication, Paul says, was God's servant for our good. There's no distinction on political affiliation or partisanship that seems to matter. Those who are in authority, Paul says, are placed there by God and are his servants for our good. So what are we supposed to do? Verse 5, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. I've talked about it before when we were going through Ephesians and when I've talked about different relationships. This word submit in scripture is one most of us don't like. We kind of grate against this idea that I'm not in control, that I don't get to choose for myself, that somebody else may get to have some authority or tell me what to do. And yet again, Paul says, it is necessary for the people of God, even under a dictator emperor like Nero, to submit. Not just because of what could happen as a consequence in the society you live in, not just because of the punishment that may come, but so that your conscience can be clear. 
submission is what's called for. And that might mean there's things that we are comfortable doing and we don't know why we've been told not to do them. And yet not out of a fear for will it be enforced or what punishment will exist, but out of respect for an understanding that those above us may be God's servants for our good, we're supposed to submit. I can come through with recent things that have happened that have been hard, certain social distancing guidelines or curfews that were put in place for a few days where we say, yeah, but I really don't think this matters where I live or where I'm a part of. I don't think this is my important thing to follow. And yet Paul would say, don't, don't worry about how it's being enforced. Don't even worry necessarily about why they came to the decision they did. Your job is to submit. And not just because you might get punished, but so that your conscience can be clear. It may look very different when it relates to things that aren't just about our recent past. I know, for instance, the stereotypical preacher illustration, one that I am guilty of all the time, both having used it as a preacher and recognized that um, I'm guilty of this just in my own life consistently, is something like speeding, everybody's favorite. Submit to the authorities, not just out of fear for punishment, not just because you see the cop or the overpass or the speed trap, so that you'd have a clear conscience. Submit. Submit. Before I move on, I just want to pause and remind us of some other things Paul has said. Just a couple of chapters ago, he used language to say to the people of God, Beware of where you're being a hypocrite because your hypocrisy blasphemes God before people. That where you're not lining up with what God has said is true, you're losing all of your accountability to be able to talk about God to others. You're blaspheming his name as you're not living that out well. And we know that that's the case. Again, this is a current example, and uh, I understand it. It's human nature when there's things that, that we don't understand, we don't like, or we see people being hypocritical, it, we quickly throw out what they've said. I watched the Facebook reactions, articles, questions. I had them myself while I was watching TV on Thursday afternoon at 1 o'clock, where a bunch of people said, hey, look, Governor Walls is at a memorial service that doesn't seem to be practicing social distancing. And the quick response is, if he's not following the thing he said, it's got to be unnecessary. Why would I have to? I don't like it. I shouldn't follow it either. Our hypocrisy throws out our credibility. And Paul is saying that about us. Not about, do we listen to our leaders? He's saying, oh, we submit to them. He doesn't give us, unless they're being hypocritical and then don't. He doesn't give us that option. He's saying, submit to them, they're servants for your own good. Do so not just as a matter of punishment, but also a matter of conscience. But then I would remind us that that means that the way that we behave, Paul has said our hypocrisy would blaspheme God. It's not just about our disobedience to our leaders, it's disobedience to God's institution and as we would be hypocritical and then go and tell others about the good news of who Jesus is, they would say, yeah, but you don't even follow the things you're instructing. I see it in your own life. You're missing the mark. Why would I listen to you? And so Paul encourages us, submit, submit. Just submit. One other thing I want to say, and I ask for grace in how this comes out uh, before I say it. Um, It's another just moment before I get back to the text. One of the things I've seen as it relates in our country specifically to how we understand government and its roles. One thing I've seen, I've, I've seen kind of, uh, there's the, the middle ground of a healthy view of government, submission to it, participation in it, maybe even pride in the place we live that is healthy and appropriate and that I think we should all have. And yet I also then watch these kinds of two extreme behaviors. And I want to just state that these extreme behaviors are something that we should maybe check if we're in an okay place, if we fall too far on either of these guidelines. One of those ends would be a complete lack 
of understanding of what our government is like, of the role we're allowed to play, of the freedoms we have that we take for granted. We have the benefit of not being under a dictator emperor. We have the benefit of being in a republic of democracy where we get opportunity to impact what our authorities do. And that's something I would think Paul would hope and scripture would hope we wouldn't take for granted and we would recognize as a privilege. At the same time, on the far opposite end of the extreme, we have people who start to place their love of country above their love of God. And their pride in our country and their patriotism become equal with or supersede God or have come, become combined where they assume we're all supposed to have the same love of country mixed with our love of God. And there are times where we develop a nationalism that is idolatry. Either of those extremes inappropriate. Most of us, I imagine, fit in the middle ground of healthy, but I just want to say it's not hard to see at times some who have gotten to far extremes. And that should be a check that we have for ourselves that we're not getting out of line and placing God as first in our lives. Paul continues then talking about some of the way that this plays out. He's talking about how it looks uh, for us to submit to our authorities. He says this in verse 7, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If you owe revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. And if honor, then honor. And I would imagine in the room and, and those watching online, we would have different understandings of which of this part of the list may be hardest. Some people may really fight against the financial structures of our society. And I think taxes are the hardest thing that they deal with as it relates to our government. Others of you, depending on the opinions you have of leaders, may think that honoring or respecting those who are above us in authority is the hardest part that's there. But Paul wants to make clear, it is not just the check we write, it's the way we talk about and treat those who are above us. It matters. We're supposed to give what we owe. We're supposed to respect those who deserve respect. We're supposed to honor those who deserve honor. And Paul moves from just talking about how we be a good citizen. The rest of this chapter, he talks then about how we be a good neighbor. He goes on to say, let no debt remain outstanding except... The continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Because of the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't covet. Whatever command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10 says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of of the law as it comes to not just being a good citizen but how we would treat the world around us love would do no harm and love would fulfill the law we need to root ourselves in love so skipping a couple verses to verse 12 let us put aside the deeds of darkness and let us put on the armor of light Let's join the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of men. Let's not operate out of our flesh, but out of our transformed, renewed mind and spirit by God. He goes on to then list what some of those deeds of darkness would be. Verse 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. With love and with submission, not with dissension, not with jealousy, not with acts of the flesh. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. As I was studying this week, this verse uniquely stuck out to me as personally convicting. It stuck out to me as personally convicting because I have recognized in my own life I have fallen into patterns of thinking that try to justify what I want to do. That my core basic fleshly concept is 
I don't know where my conscience lands on something. I think maybe it's okay, maybe it's bad. I don't know where I should fall. How about what I'll spend my time doing is thinking about how I'm allowed to gratify those desires. Are there ways I can argue and persuade others into an understanding that maybe it's okay? Can I work it in with some unique new interpretation of Scripture? Can I twist this verse or take this thing out of context so that I'm allowed to gratify the thing that will feel good to me at the moment? And I was studying this verse this week and Paul just makes it clear. Not just don't do these actions. Stop trying to spend your time thinking about how you can find permission for things you know you're not supposed to be doing. It is not a valuable, wise use of your time. Stop doing it. And yet he says this to us very personally and not in ways that we're supposed to use it to hold over others. What we're going to see is this whole next chapter is about how we would recognize that we might individually all come to very different conclusions on what kinds of things are acceptable and what kinds of things aren't. That there are lots of gray areas that we can disagree about. And verse, or chapter 14 begins, so accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. When it's in dispute, when it's debatable, when you can argue either side of it, Paul says, just accept the person who's doing it differently than you. Don't spend the time quarreling over these things. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It may be important to you, and that's allowable, but you need to start asking, is this disputable? Is it okay if people disagree? And again, Paul's saying this to a very particular context in the first century, the Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And so he uses three primary illustrations. If you read through the next few verses, you'll see he first talks about food, that this comes when it's about what kind of meat you can eat, particularly talking about like meat sacrificed to idols and is it clean or unclean and what can you eat and what can't you eat. And Paul essentially says that's a disputable matter. Let's not hold that over other people. He talks about sacred days. So different holy festivals the Jewish people still wanted to participate in or different Sabbath understandings they had, sacred days understandings. And he talks about drink and what kind of drunkenness or wine or drink you can or can't have. And he uses these as examples for these Jew and Gentile believers to just say, let's understand some of these things are disputable. In fact, Paul's pretty aware for the last three years or so, they've been disputing them. Paul says, stop fighting about that. Stop fighting about that. He sums it up in verse 6. He says, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord, and whoever meets, eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. These things can all be done while giving thanks to God. And so he has this question about where we stand in a place of understanding or personal conviction. Well, Paul asks this question in verse 10. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Stop. Judging others. For most of us, when the judgment started, it moves beyond just judgment. And so he continues to stop treating others with contempt because of disputable matters. What I know is the judgment begins inside and it can be personal and it can, it can create all sorts of havoc in the ways our relationships play out. But maybe one of the clearest things that can happen to damage the people of God is when those judgments turn into division because we have contempt over people who disagree with us. When we get 
prideful that we're on the correct side of things, the weak or the strong side of things, and that they aren't, and we start to act in contempt of them. We start to distance ourselves from them. We refuse to interact with them. We cease loving them, the thing that fulfills all the commandments. We cease doing that and choose contentment instead. It's damaging to the church. It's damaging to the kingdom of God. And Paul is clear we need to stop doing it. Because again, verse 12, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And it won't be just about if we ate the meat or didn't eat the meat, if we observed the festival or didn't observe the festival. It would be about if we judged them or didn't judge them. It would be about if we held them in contempt or didn't hold them contempt. It would be about if we loved well or didn't love well. It would be about if we submitted or didn't submit. We will all stand before God to give an account. So again, he reminds us in verse 13, stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Make it as easy as possible for everybody to be in peace-filled, loving relationship with you and with God. And he clarifies again some of those weak and strong things. Verse 14, I am convinced, he goes back to this eating illustration, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. That nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it's unclean. There's no basis by which we can universally say for all of us, that kind of food, that kind of drink, it's unclean and needs to be avoided. But as you have been convicted by God and his spirit working through you, that something is something you should avoid, you better obey and avoid it. But don't start judging others who haven't had that same conviction and don't start holding them in contempt for having a different conviction than you. Always think of others instead. Verse 15 continues that. So if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for who Christ died. If you know of the strong conviction of someone else and you're in relationship with them, do everything you can to make sure your behaviors aren't becoming a stumbling block to them. That's your job as we are other focused and love our neighbors well. For the kingdom of God, verse 17 says, is not just a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so our job is then to do the things that lead to peace. Verse 19 says that, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Don't just hope that they see your side. Don't just defend yourself or try to prove yourself. Behave in a way that brings peace. And maybe the hardest for us. Let me pause that. I won't speak on behalf of anybody else. Maybe the hardest for me. Is verse 22. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. You don't have to convince everybody else that you've figured it out. You don't need the convictions you have to be validated by convincing other people to have the same ones. It doesn't have to happen. Instead, we can try to live in peace. We can try to remove stumbling blocks. We can try to love our neighbors as ourselves. We can be quiet 
about things that are deeply meaningful to us, which is hard. Every time we hear from God, there's this part like, man, if I heard from God, I want to share that. Man, if this is passionate and meaningful to me, I want to express that. And Paul says, when it comes to disputable matters, be careful. If what you're saying is helping or hurting, it might be creating division and judgment and contempt. Now, I'm not saying that means we never talk about them. As the people of God, we're supposed to do life in relationship and not as individual silos. And so, yes, those conversations can happen, but we need to make sure that as we're having them, they're happening for the edification of God and the believers, not for the tearing down and judging of other believers. If that's the motive to create arrogance or pride or superiority, to defend, define ourselves as the strong believers instead of the weak ones. Paul says clearly, if that's true, be silent. Keep it between yourself and God. It has not been official. And so I would encourage us to each ask the question, when we're thinking about that conviction we have, that passion we have, that understanding we have, the best way to live out our faith, to stop and ask a question before we ever bring it up with others, before we ever start to uh, judge others, before we ever start to tell others it's the way they should behave, just to ask the simple question, is this a disputable matter? We can be passionate and convicted and admit and some other people might have some disputes about this particular conviction. That's okay. We can disagree and be in unity and love in the family of God together. Is this a disputable matter? And if it is, do everything you can to live at peace with others, to edify them, to be in unity with them, to not put stumbling blocks before them. Paul, as he's getting close to the end of this letter, says essentially, be people of submission, be people of love. My hope for us, all of us, is that we would do that. I'm convinced we can't do it in our own power. And so my hope is that we rely on the spirit that's been placed inside of us as we received Jesus as Savior, as God's spirit is inside of us, that we would find that power and the fruit that comes from that spirit. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that come not because of the work we do, but because of the work God does in and through us. This all comes as a result of us offering ourselves as living sacrifices. I'm going to pray that we would do that and then live that out well. Would you join me in that prayer? And God, we're thankful. We're thankful that we don't go this journey alone, but that you have joined us fully in it, that you carry the load, that you take the burden from us, and that your power then joins and flows through us. And so we pray that that power would overflow. And that we would walk out a life of submission to you. And that we would play that out as we submit to you in the ways that you've encouraged us to as we would then submit to other authorities as well. Not simply because of fear of punishment, because of the clear conscience that we would then have by being in line with what you've instituted in our world. And we pray that we would live in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would do so putting no stumbling blocks in front of others over disputable matters, that we would ask ourselves if the things we're passionate about are things we have to talk about or if they're things better left between us and you, and that you would help us discern that well. We pray for that gift of discernment that would come from your spirit as well. And then we're hopeful that we would do that well in a way then that our behavior isn't hypocritical and it doesn't blaspheme your name. And as we then proclaim to the world about who you are, we do so with behaviors and words and actions that all speak to your glory and that draw people to place faith in you. 
so that they could be made righteous the same way we are. We pray all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thankful for those of you who have been watching digitally with us. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Those of you in the room, just a couple of quick construct instructions. The way it works best for us in the way things are going to need to be sanitized is going to be if you'll exit out the doors on this side. So either through the back hallway or through here and then go up through door C. We'll be doing some sanitizing in this lobby, getting ready for our next service in those. And many of you have communion cups. There's some trash cans over by this door as well. You can place those in. If you brought an offering, there's an offering offering box you can place that in as well it's wonderful to see you I hope you find it wonderful to see other people here as well I would encourage you to connect with them but to do so hopefully outside it's a better social distancing thing it's easier for us to get the building ready and so we'd encourage you to have those conversations say hi to people you enjoy and love meet people you don't yet know all of those kinds of things as you go go with grace and peace you are dismissed.